we're going to be in chapter 6 and uh, verse 3 as we get started here. We're talking about the first four horses. We covered one last week and it was the white horse. Now we're going to look at the three other horses. There's a red one, a black, and a pale horse. And they're all connected with the second, third, and fourth seals being open. And there's seven seals. So let's look at Revelation verse 3. It says, When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. So here we have the living creature again. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard a second living creature say, Come. Then another horse came out. It was fiery red. So the red horse, its rider was given power to take peace. To take peace. So there was peace in the world, but the rider, God is saying, take peace out of the world. And then what's the next thing? And to make men slay each other, to him was given a large sword. Now, I'm just saying that. Would God do such a thing? We hear this all the time. Oh, why are these earthquakes happening and thousands of people dying? And all? God, why does God do things like And they get mad at God because things are going on like this. You know, this is no big thing for God. Because this life on earth is nothing. We put so much uh, emphasis on it. We, it's so important to us. But God would say, if you only knew how insignificant this life is that you're living, you wouldn't worry about it for a minute. And so, but we look at things just basically and say, why? Why are these things happening? And, and then we get mad at God. What we have to do is guard our heart. Don't get mad at God. Say, if it's God's will, it's God's will. Whatever God's will is. So God, show me what am I to do in, the, in light of this. Well, go take care of whoever's left. You might go out and do that. Try to dig him out underneath an earthquake building that fell down or something like that. Try to nurse him back to life. Everything that we're doing. We're supposed to go on in life this way. But don't get mad because thousands of people died. Because he has a purpose for that. Okay. Would God give someone a sword to slay a peaceful world with it? You know, so we say, oh, we finally have peace. Like I've told you before, people have come to me and wanted me to, oh, get together and let's pray for peace. Jesus said he's not coming for peace. <laughs> Do you want me to pray against the Bible? You know, that's not it. In fact, in Revelation, he says he's going to take peace away. The only peace in this world is going to be when he takes over. And then there will be peace that man cannot understand. The world cannot understand it. Let's check quickly the rest of the Bible here. As I said, the Pentateuch to Apocalypse, so it can be in the New Testament, further in the Old Testament. So Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Says, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. See, now that's in Matthew. John in Revelation wrote the same thing. It's taking peace out of the earth. To him was given a large sword. He brought a sword. Okay. And the topic number three, we're going all the way back to Daniel now. If you had been here when I first started this, this uh, teaching, I started with Daniel. And there was a reason for it. It's because it's so connected. Daniel's right in the middle of the Bible, right in the middle of the Pentateuch to Apocalypse. But Daniel is having uh, interpretations of dreams that fit into this whole thing. So we're going to look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 7. In the Old Testament, our friend Daniel was in the middle of an interpretation when he stumbled on to the same period of time that was going to happen in the future that we're talking about now. He says, After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. When I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, among this, these ten horns, and three 
of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. So what we saw here, now see, I, I, when we're studying now, you've got to be looking at this symbolism because it all has a part of it. That Daniel was seeing ten horns, ten horns, and then another little one was coming up in the ten horns. Now Daniel 7, chapter, or verse 23 now, he gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is the fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling him down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. Now, I bored everybody with my uh, picture. This is what Daniel was interpreting. King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of the sky. Now we're talking about the fourth kingdom here. It says over on the other side with the arrows going up, Rome. So it's Rome. This fourth one that he's talking about, one, two, three, four, and then five. And where is that? That's Rome. Okay. It said uh, the fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the others. Now it says a beast. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. So it's going to crush there over there. The tenth, ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. Those are the ten kingdoms that are going to come from the other kingdom. Okay, now I want to tell you this because, let's see, after them another king will rise different from the earlier ones and he will subdue three of these kings. And so this is part of the rest, rest of the teaching. Those ten toes in God's eyes are still considered part of the Roman Empire. Now, I just keep that in mind, and I'll explain what I mean by that. The white horse last time was the conqueror coming out. The red horse this time is the mighty destruction coming to the world, through which the ten nations, kingdoms, horns, or toes, however you want to look at it, will come out of it. And we see that from out of that, the ten kingdoms, comes one small kingdom or a horn which we now recognize as antichrist so out of those ten toes or ten kingdoms or ten horns that we're seeing here will come one little one and that's going to be the one that you talk what you hear about all the time but is the antichrist and point six so many people come to me and say where is the United States going to be in all of this? And you probably have heard that before. You probably wondered about this before. Where will the United States be? If there's only 10 nations that, that we're hearing in Revelation, then where would they be? How many nations, kingdoms, and rules are there in the world? There's a lot more than 10, right? There are a lot more than 10. The statue, what we see is, is got 10 there, and it's the revised Roman Empire. Not meaning at all that Rome is going to attack all these countries and turn them over to, to them that once belonged to her, but they're only in God's eyes as the revised Roman Empire. What I'm, the point I'm trying to make here is the uh, interpretation of Daniel was that the countries that once were Roman are still Roman in God's eyes. Do you see the point that I'm trying to make? These will be the ten kingdoms or nations around the Mediterranean Sea. Because back in those days, they were all belonged to Rome. That's during the time that Paul wrote the book of Romans and all that. Look at the nuclear potential this area down here is beginning to get. If God would decide to bring a monster down on all those nations around the Mediterranean Sea, conquer them, and allow ten to survive to be kingdoms, it wouldn't be very hard to do. We're scared to death now. India and uh, Pakistan is it? They both are nuclear powers. Israel is a nuclear power. There's a lot of them down there now, probably more than we realize. Uh, Iraq's trying to get all those nations are getting the same power that we have. <coughs> and, then one, and then have one other small one come up and crush three of those kingdoms. So if there's a big monster came down in that whole area, and then there are 10 nations that survive that. And then out of those 10 nations, a little one arises and, <laughs> and subdues three of them. So there's only seven left. And the rest of the seven 
submit to Antichrist or to this little horn that came up. This is what we can look at. This is what Revelation that we're talking about right now is saying. That there will be ten, three of them will be destroyed, and that's where Antichrist destroys them. And then the other seven submit, and now there are ten or seven, but Antichrist is in charge at this point. So the monster we're looking about, the warfare, the conqueror is the white horse, the, and it's not Jesus as we looked at last, last time. He's on, he's on a white horse, but he's a conqueror, but he's not Jesus. He's going to come out, it's going to destroy the three toes, and then uh, uh, the war will be the war that comes just prior to these ten nations being formed. Now we're always talking about, oh, there's ten nations right now. I had to give you this whole scenario to, to connect what we're talking about here. There's nothing new under the sun. God has all things planned. And as far as he is concerned, they are finished in God's eyes. So why should Christians be concerned about this? We shouldn't be, except that we clean up the mess and we do whatever God tells us to do, right? We're just, we're writing it out. We're getting ready for when Jesus returns and gets us out of this place. Okay, so it's finished. The final nails put into the coffin of Satan are the ones they put into the hands and feet of Jesus. It was finished on the cross. Jesus said that. He said, it is finished. He could see right then, immediately. It's over with. He did it on the cross. Okay, let's go to Revelation 6, verse 5. If what I've said is true, then let's look at the rest of the seals. And this one is opening the seals and the next two horses. Revelation 6, 5. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hands. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a day's wages. And do not damage the oil and the wine. Well, I'm not going to get involved with all of that. We can at another time if you want. What it is is the accounting of the wheat and barley indicates that the black horse has brought famine, probably due to the warfare. So we have the conqueror coming on the white horse. The red horse is the warfare that's coming down on this area of the Mediterranean Sea where the ten nations are going to rise in one little one. And now because of all of this horrible warfare that has gone on, there's famine. Of course, there's famine right now because of earthquakes and things that are going around, around the world. So, the black horse brings famine. Now, Revelation verse seven, 6, verse 7. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice from the fourth living creature say, Come! I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider's name, Death and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. Okay, now you've seen these three things, these four uh, horses. So what are they again? White horse was the conqueror, and then the second horse is warfare. Ten nations arise out of this with one little one's going to be coming up. And the third horse was a black horse, right? And after the war is famine. All of this is going on. It may not even happen here. It may be going on around the Mediterranean. They didn't talk about the United States and Canada and, and Russia and Cuba and things like this in the Bible. They, the Bible was only talking about the area around the Holy Land there. Okay, and the last one was the pale horse, and the pale horse was death. And how did death come about? The death came about the sword we talked about, but also the famine. The famine is going to bring disease probably and all kinds of stuff. People are going to die from these things, and that's where the plague is. Plagues are going to come in, and everybody's going to be very sick and, and, and not being able to cope with all of this. And then what's left? The wild beasts come in and take care of the rest of it. The Bible talks about the vultures coming and eating the meat off of bones and stuff like this. So if you want to know the four horses of the apocalypse, that's it, the four horses. It's not clear whether the grave or Hades was on the separate horse 
than death or merely just rode along with it because it says following close behind was Hades or death. But the riders described from two to eight are commonly referred to as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Although God, God shows his love to all and gives another chance doesn't mean that he has altered his plans at all. More Old Testament prophecy proves this. The weeping prophet Jeremiah there is still time for unbelievers to turn to Christ and away from their sin. In this case, the limited punishment not only demonstrates God's wrath on sin, but also his merciful love in giving people yet another opportunity to turn to him before he brings final judgment. I just see this so much in the Bible. Wherever he's coming down, boom, he's giving love at the same time. We read about Jeremiah and we say, well, he's out there weeping over Israel because of what they, she's done. But he is weeping over what is about to happen as well, he was. He cried out, cried out warnings of this in the New Testament time. So here's Jeremiah 14, verse 12. Although they fast, I will not listen to their cry. Though they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Instead, I will destroy them with the sword, famine, and plague. See those three words again? They were over in Revelation. Here they are in Jeremiah saying the same thing. So this is what he's talking about. He's talking about end times. He's talking about the uh, tribulation period there. Okay, uh, Jeremiah 15, 2, 15, 2. And if they ask you, where shall we go? Tell them this is what the Lord says. Those destined for death to death. Those, dest those for the sword to the sword. Those for salvation, to salvation. Those for captivity, to captivity. <laughs> oh, it's a great answer, God. Thank you. <laughs> Where should we go so we can be saved from the sword? No, if you're going to get the sword, just go to the sword. <laughs> so what can we worry about? We can't worry about anything. I may die from a sword. You know, those for starvation, to starvation. So there's the famine. If you're going to die of a famine, well, that's where you're going to die. Whatever it is, it's not that important. Do you see the point that I'm getting? Live your life fully while you have it, and thank God for every day. You wake up in the morning, and just that's why you should be on your knees. Just thank it. Lord, thank you, Lord. Give me another day. Let me Show me how I can serve you today, because maybe tomorrow won't come. <laughs> you know, We need to thank you for every minute that we've got, every breath that we take. Symbolism shows us a very jealous God in love with a two-time and prostitute adulterer. There's several places in the Old Testament where we see that. He looks at Israel as a two-time and... I, wrote, I made up these things. Two-time and prostitute adulterer. Anything you could come up with. This is what he, how he looks at Israel that he loves. It's my interpretation of Song of Songs is God is putting that in the Bible and it is representative of the woman he loves or we might say the woman but he's thinking Israel he made a promise to get revenge the wrath of God to be poured out in end times on this woman Israel he made a promise for and so the promise has to be fulfilled he forgives but his promises must be kept kept why otherwise we are without hope we have hope because every one of his promises he keeps. And he has been storing up his wrath against Israel since the beginning of Israel. Since the beginning. He wanted to give up on humanity altogether, I think. And a lot of the prophets argued with him in the Bible. And he hung in. That's why I think we have to go through Jesus now in our prayers to get to him. He doesn't want to hear about it. It's done. It's finished. We just go to Jesus. Jesus says, hey, Jay's okay. <laughs> Let me handle him. God says, you take care of Jay. I don't want to hear from him. <laughs> if he's going to pray, let him pray through you. You filter it to see if it's okay. Let's co close by looking at the broken heart of God through the eyes of Hosea. Hosea 13, 4. But I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. You shall acknowledge no God before me, no Savior except me. I cared for you in the desert, in the land of burning heat. When I fed them, they were satisfied. When they were satisfied, they became proud. Then they forgot me. 
So I'll come on them like a lion, like a leopard. I will look by the path like a, a bear robbed of her cubs. And we're familiar with that. They say, don't get between a bear and her cubs. That bear will rip you apart. God is use, using this. I will attack them and rip them open. Like a lion, I will devour them. A wild animal will tear them apart. You are destroyed, O Israel, because you are against me, against your helper. This is what Hosea wrote down that was in God's heart against Israel. He, to me, it was a broken heart that was seeking revenge. And we see him here. He says, vengeance is mine. Don't do anything to those Israelites. I'm going to take care of them. When? In the last seven years. The tribulation period. I'm going to form a church before then. The church era that we're in right now. The 69th week of Daniel and the 70th week. The 70th week that Daniel sees is going to be the tribulation period. But in between then, I'm going to put my church together. And my church is going to be made up of people that accept Jesus, my son, Jesus Christ. And they're going to be saying, I love Jesus more than anything in life, more than my family, more than money, more than life itself. I'm going to make up a church of these kind of people, that they love Jesus more than church, more than a pulpit, more than a statue, more than a cathedral, more than music, more than anything in life. And if they love my Jesus, my son Jesus, that much, they'll be a part of my church. And I'm going to come and get them before the 70th week begins. And they're going to be with me. I'm going to get them out of there. They're not appointed to wrath. My wrath is against Israel. And so we have a few Christians getting just like Israelites. God loves the believers and his son. We who believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and died for our sins. We take great comfort in this. And he satisfies our needs. So much like the Israelites. Have we become satisfied and then become proud? And then have we even in the slightest way forgotten him? We have. And we may have to experience those seven years along with the Israelites. But we see in the scripture that there will be those at the banquet who have lost their head because of their belief in Jesus Christ. Those are the tribulation saints. Let's not be one of those. We don't have to do that. <laughs> All we need to do is have that relationship with Jesus right now that we love him so much. It's, it's above going to church. It's above our family. It's above everything. It's above earthquakes over in Europe or wars or abortions or whatever. It's above all of this. We just focus on him. And when he comes back, we're going to be looking for him. <laughs> when he comes, there we go. Otherwise, we may have to experience what the Jews are experiencing. They have salvation, but they're going to have to go through God's wrath, which is that last seven years. We don't have to. So let's pray. Thank you.